Good morning and happy Mother's Day. I look forward and celebrate Mother's Day so much. Um, I really look forward to, though, the, the sweet and thoughtful notes that I get from my kids and my family. I feel like if it wasn't for Mother's Day, I wouldn't really know how they feel. But so they're, um, we're, moms are always getting a lot of thank you notes during this time, right? But I thought that maybe it's time for us moms to share with the world what we're thankful for. So I actually have some Mother's Day thank you notes that I need to send out. Do you all mind if I take a moment and write some of them here with you? Okay, let's see. Thank you, my bathroom, for being the only place I can finally get some peace and qu I said not now! Where was I? Thank you, every kid I have, for showing me all of the weirdest parts of my own personality, like laughing at really inappropriate times. Thank you, sleep, for abandoning me the second I became a mother, even though you're the one thing I need right now. Thank you, the show Doomsday Preppers, for helping other people get ready for the apocalypse and simply helping me get ready for the rest of the day. Thank you to the word no for being the same in nearly every language, but every time I say it, it doesn't make sense to my kids. <sighs> Thank you to all the moms in the room for all you do for your loved ones, for helping the world see what unconditional love is, for being our absolute favorite person. To all the moms, we love you. Happy Mother's Day. Let's give a round of applause to all the moms. Oh, any other mamas feel that? <clears throat> the bathroom is one sacred space to mothers. Amen. Well, good morning. Happy Mother's Day to all you mamas in the room. Uh, so excited that you're worshiping with us this morning. My name is Sarah. I'm one of the pastors here. And I know there are all different kinds of mamas we are celebrating today. We have bio mamas and adoptive mamas and single mamas and spiritual mothers and all kinds of mothers. So thank you. Thank you to the mothers who are always giving and loving and just continuing to encourage us and be the inspiration. And I know that for some of us, today is bittersweet or even just bitter. Um, Mother's Day is such a wonderful celebration, but could it, it can also be a really tough day for a lot of us. Some of us, we're mourning the loss of our mom or we're mourning the loss of a child. And today is really, really tough. Um, for some of us, we're, we're mourning the loss of being a mom. Um, we're, we're here today and we're worshiping and it's a, a reminder of a loss we feel every day that we still haven't had that child that we've been waiting for and praying for. And so whatever you, whatever space you're in today, we want you to know you're not alone. You're seen and we stand with you. And I'm glad that you're worshiping. I'm glad that you're getting into the presence of God. You're connecting with God. You're connecting with his people because the Bible tells us that this is a body of Christ, right? And we need one another. When one of us hurts, we all feel it. And we need that strength and that encouragement. And so if you have somebody in your life that you know today is difficult for, reach out to them. Let them know that you're standing with them, that you're encouraging them and praying for them. And for, for all of us today, we know we want to honor our moms. I want to take a moment and just honor my mom. So I have a picture of me and my mom. My mom is a tough cookie. She usually worships with us first service. I didn't check with her. So mom, if you're online, second service, I love you. You are amazing. Um, my mama went back to school to get a, a nursing degree with five kids. She was a pastor's wife. She played the piano every Sunday. She is a beast. Um, and she just taught me how to do really difficult things and not make excuses. There was no excuse for chasing after the dreams that I had. And she really encouraged me and pushed me to always go for that. And she always showed me how to do that with the heart of a servant and with kindness and love. So thank you, mom. I love you. Yep. And I want to celebrate my mom. This is a photo of us. Um, I love that photo. We're sitting there laughing together. My mom is a pastor in the Chicago area. So mom, if you're watching this, I love you. You're amazing. 
Um, I was that kid who was difficult for my mom. I know that. Okay, some of you guys were right there with me. I know I tested her patience, but she was always so loving and kind and encouraging me and challenging me in the ways that I needed to be challenged. And I'm so thankful. Um, I know that who I am today is because of the investment that my mom made in my life and the difference. And then I want to take a moment also and celebrate Sarah um, as a mom. So we have eight kids, eight kids. So you know that um, she is an amazing mom just with the love that she has for them. And once again, she's willing to have those hard conversations. And there's a lot of them to be had with eight kids. But to encourage them to see the potential in their life and to call that out, she does such an amazing job. So Sarah, I'm so thankful for you. And this morning, as we look at this message, this is what I want to say is there is no perfect mom. Okay, I had an amazing mother. Sarah did as well. She's an amazing mom. None of us are perfect in this room, okay? But what we want to look at this morning is from Scripture, just an ex a few examples of moms from the Bible, okay? And once again, just like us, these moms always didn't do everything right. They weren't perfect. But they did do some things that we can learn from and that we can grow from. Now, in case you're not a mom, okay, so guys in the room or dads or if you're not a mom yet, this isn't your chance to check out, okay? So what we're going to talk about today is good encouragement for all of us. It's things that each and every one of us need to be reminded of no matter what season of life that we're in. So I hope you would engage and allow God to challenge your heart and to encourage you in these different um, ways as we look at a few examples of some of the amazing moms in the Bible and their impact on their kids and others. Yes. So the first mother that we're going to take a look at, her name is Hannah. So if you have your Bibles, if you would turn to the book of First Samuel, we're going to start in chapter one. Um, you can grab a smartphone, you, your tablet. We want to be engaging with scripture. Scripture shapes our lives. It has authority in our life. And so we always want to make sure that we're engaging with the scriptures one-on-one -on -one as well. So we're going to start in First Samuel chapter one in verse 10. But before we start reading, I want to give you a little bit of background. So when we meet Hannah right here, Hannah's actually not a mom yet. Um, she actually is married to a man who has another wife who has a lot of children. And Hannah is kind of off to the side and, and spends a lot of her time alone. And she's praying all the time and always believing and asking God to be a mother. She wants to be a mother. And so when we catch up to Hannah right here in this chapter, her whole family has traveled to Jerusalem for a celebration. And she has slipped away during a time when everyone else is doing something else to get into the temple by herself and to pray. And so this is where we catch up to her in verse 10. It says, in her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. And as she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli, who's the priest, observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. So it goes on to say that Eli actually thinks she's drunk. He thinks there's a bunch of celebration going on, and you drag yourself in here to the altar. You need to get out of here. And she says, no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm, I am so desperate. I want a child, and I'm just trying to pray as fervently as I can that I can go home and I can have a child. And God hears her and answers her prayer. She goes home, she becomes pregnant, and a couple of years later, she follows through on her promise to the Lord. She has a son, she names him Samuel, and down in verse 24, it says, when the child was weaned, Hannah took him to the tabernacle in Shiloh, and they brought along a three-year-old bull for the sacrifice and a basket of flour and some wine, and after sacrificing the bull, they brought the boy to Eli, the priest, and she says, hey, do you remember me? So remember me? I'm the one that you thought, you know, was, was drunk, but I was just praying. I'm the woman who stood here several years ago praying to the Lord, and I asked the Lord to give me this boy, and he's granted my request. Now I am giving the boy to the Lord, and he will belong to the Lord his whole life. And so Hannah persisted in prayer. She prayed persistently and did not give up. And she so desperately wanted to be a mother that she said, if you give me a son, I don't even have to keep him in my house. I will give him back to you, Lord. And what we see is this incredible result. Because Hannah prayed, 
Samuel's born, Samuel that is the one that this book of the Bible is named after, he becomes a leader and a prophet to the people. He anoints the king of Israel. He anoints King David. And even as a child, later it says, and he's growing up in the presence of the Lord. What a beautiful way to grow up. And when Eli the priest, it says during this time, there, the words from the Lord were rare. Eli the priest doesn't hear the voice of God. Samuel does. Samuel, a boy that is sleeping in the temple of the Lord. And we see this incredible nation changed because a mother prayed, because she wouldn't give up, because she persisted and prayed day after day, week after week, month after month, and God honored her. And not only did she have Samuel, she ended up having many other children as well. But the whole trajectory of a nation was changed because of the way that she prayed. Yeah, and I think about that, just the power of prayer and I know for some of you parents in the room, or maybe you're an aunt or an uncle, and you have that niece or nephew that you love so much, sometimes it's hard in those moments as they're growing up to see what they go through. Um, you know, our older son, Matt, lives in Illinois. Josiah is in the Marines. Two of our other older kids are in Bible college right now. And parents, you understand this. It feels like my heart is walking around in all of these different places. And sometimes I worry about what are they doing? Like, what's going on in their life? Are they okay? Because they're so far away and I can't see them. And God always reminds me, even though I can't protect them from everything, I can't direct all their steps, you guys, I can pray. I can pray for God to guide them. I can pray for the day that they're going to have. And so I start almost every morning just by waking up and, and praying for the kids that are still in the house with us, our kids that are already out, for God's hand and God's blessing to be over them. And I was reminded of that, just the power of prayer. Just a couple of weeks ago, I was with a mentoring group um, that I'm in a year-long thing with, and we were each sharing our story. And I shared with them, if you've been around the church for a little bit, how in high school I walked away from God. And my brother and I were in a very dark place. We were not doing good, not pursuing a relationship with Jesus or connected with the church. And man, our life did not look like it was going in a good direction. And I remember after I'd come back to God and I was in Bible college, I was talking to my grandma and she said, Aaron, I didn't know everything going on in your life, but every day of your high school years, I was praying for you. Every day I was praying that God would get a hold of you, that God would do something in your life. My mom, the same way, she prayed for me and she said, Aaron, I saw some of the direction you were going. It was so hard. It was so difficult, but I did not stop praying that you would understand God's calling and God's potential over your life and that you would come back to the Lord. And now I look at the power of those prayers. My mom's a pastor. My brother and I are both pastors. Now we have three of her grandchildren that are studying for the ministry. And all of that is because of the power of prayer. So some of you, you may have kids or loved ones or family members. You may be watching this online and you know who I'm talking about. It's that person that you love, that child, that teenager, and it feels like they've walked away from God. The most powerful thing that you can do is to pray, never stop praying for their life, church. Never stop praying for God to speak to them, for them to realize their potential, that God's hand would be upon them. I love this picture of Hannah, that she was willing to keep praying until God answered her prayer, and it made an impact on those future generations. Yeah, and I know that in the church, Aaron and I were youth pastors now, like decades ago, which makes me feel really, really old. Some of y'all who are adults and have your own kids in here would have been in our youth group. That's frightening. Um, but we've watched over the years of the change in generations, right? It's, it was different between me and my parents, but it is really different between my parents and my kids. We are now at a cultural gap, not just a generational gap. And listen, I know it can be really easy to look at the children and the teenagers and even young adults of today and to complain about them. But can I challenge you, church, before you speak a word of negativity, speak words of prayer, over their lives because we need a generation of people who will pray and speak words of life over the next generations that are coming up in our country. We need a church who will not just complain about the kids who don't know how to behave in service or the kids who don't know how to hold down a job or the kids who don't know how to work really hard and pray for them and pray for them and pray for them and continue to pray for them just like Hannah prayed to have a son. That's what these kids need. So I love that. The, the next woman that we want to look at in the Bible, her name is Bathsheba. And this may connect with some of you guys. I love this because 
she was in a very disruptive, dysfunctional family. So for those of you that may count yourself out or you're like, well, I didn't have a good role model. Man, you have a great picture here in the Bible of someone that, that had a very, very difficult family life. And part of Bathsheba's story, you may be familiar with this. We talked about it a few weeks ago. Is She's married to, um, to David, who was the king over the people of God in the nation of Israel. And how she comes into that family is David brings her in. She, he has an affair with her, um, has her husband murdered so that David can marry her, so that the king can marry her. Um, so a lot of dysfunction there. Um, she loses one of her first ch- children in that marriage. Um, one of her other, I guess, um, stepchildren is trying to disrupt the kingdom and break up and take it away from David, and his life is ended. There's other um, issues of sexuality within the family that are causing problems. Like There is a lot of dysfunction in this home. And yet we see her as a mom who stands as a pillar and who is willing to do what she needs to to protect and to stand up for the next generation. And we see this in 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 15. And so this is at the end of David's life. Her and Bathsheba are older, and he's getting ready to pass on. And so the question comes up, who's going to be the next king of Israel? And Adonijah sneaks in and he tries to steal the kingdom from what God had declared needed to happen. And so Bathsheba, in 1 Kings 1, 15, this is what it says. Bathsheba went to see the aged king in his room, so that's David, where Abishag the Shuamite was attending him. Bathsheba bowed down and she prostrated herself before the king. What is it that you want? The king asked. So she said to him, my Lord, you yourself swore to me, your servant, by the Lord, your God, that Solomon, that was her son, our son shall be king after you. He will sit on your throne. But now Adonijah has become king and you, my Lord, the king, do not know about it. Now, you may read this and think, well, that was nice. Like, this is a mom kind of going and standing up for her son. But she's actually risking her life in this moment. Adonijah has just stolen the kingdom, and he's there in the palace. He's there in the throne area. If he would have gotten any glimpse or any word that Bathsheba was going and declaring that Solomon needed to be the king by the word of the Lord, he probably would have had her killed, would have had her life ended. Her life was at risk here. But she is willing to stand up for her son, for Solomon, because this is what God had spoken needed to happen. And I thought about another mom, Moses' mom, if you're familiar with him from the Bible, Jochebed, who protected her own son. This is when the Egyptian soldiers were coming and killing the infants, killing young babies, and they were destroying the life of these young Israelite children. And she took Moses and she hid him. And then she placed him in a basket, you may be familiar with this story, and directed him down the Nile, and he was adopted by Egyptian royalty. Once again, she was willing to place her life in danger. Like if one of the soldiers would have captured her or found out that she was protecting this young baby, her young child, like her life would have been ended. And yet she was willing to stand up for the next generation. And we're called to do that same thing, to stand up for the young children, for our children, for the next generation of what God has called them to do and to protect them. Yeah, I think sometimes this looks different. I think all of us would probably jump in front of a car to save a kid, right? We would we would do something to protect a child. But sometimes this looks like just protecting our children, sometimes from themselves, um, sometimes from other things that are coming their way that we know are dangerous. It's having really difficult discussions to protect a legacy that is within our kids. And sometimes when we see our kids going down a path, it's us standing there and saying, hey, this is not the way to go. And just continuing to challenge them and encourage them and to try to protect them from getting into something that they just honestly shouldn't belong getting into. And often it's staying connected enough, right? Like especially as our kids become teenagers, they want a little bit of space, right? Um, But I've told parents year after year after year, like fight to stay connected. Yes, your kids need some independence, but stay in relationships. Stay as the primary influencer in their life. You have to fight for that position because other people are going to try to take it from you. Stay connected so that when you see danger coming along, you have that connection to them to say, I'm going to protect you. I'm going to stand in the gap. I'm going to stand here with you because you don't even see what's coming your way, but I see it. Yeah, and as Sarah and I were talking, we were thinking um, of our older son, Matt, and whenever he was in high school, so this is quite a, quite a long time ago, um, 
he came to us. He was really connected at school, so he did, like, choir and theater and was in a number of different groups. Like, everyone really loved him. And so he comes home one day, and he says, Dad, I've met this girl, and I think I really like her. And so I said, okay. You know, Sarah and I sat down. We said, let's talk about this. What do you like about her? Dad, she's really pretty. And I'm like, okay, that's awesome. What else do you like about her? Like, is she funny? What about her personality? I don't know, Dad, but she is really pretty. And I'm like, okay. So we just started talking about, like, hey, Matt, I didn't want to see Matt get hurt or emotionally involved in a relationship that wasn't a good fit for him. And so we just encouraged him, Matt, we want to encourage you, get to know her, find out about her, like, what are her likes, what are her dislikes. And so he took that advice, and he's like, I'm not going to rush into something, like, we're just going to be friends right now. And so Matt comes home about two weeks later, and he says, Dad, you know that girl I liked? And I was like, yeah. He's like, she was making out with another guy in second period today. And I was like, yeah, that wasn't the one, Matt. And he's like, yep, Dad, that wasn't the one. And so we have to have that challenge, parents, sometimes to step in. That's what it means standing up for the next generation, where sometimes that's a difficult conversation sometimes. But we need to steer and guide our kids and really protect them many times from themselves, from others that would try to come in and destroy what God wants to do in their life. You are called to be that protector. And once again, it may be for others that are around you. You may have influence with other kids where you can step up and you can be that protector that we see these amazing women of the Bible of making sure that they're guarding and they're standing up for the next generation. And so the last mother that we're going to look at today is probably the most famous is Mary, the mother of Jesus. And and most of us know about Mary, but sometimes, you know, Mary's kind of deified. She's treated like she was she was somehow different, but she was a human being who was also a mother, Um, and she was a mother not just to any child, but she was a mother to the Son of God. And so sometimes it's easy to forget that she spent, you know, 30 years where mostly no one knew who Jesus was and who he was called to be. And so we see Mary, and she, she calls out the potential in her child. And so if you look in Luke chapter 2, verse 51, this is the story where Mary and Joseph take Jesus with a whole bunch of other people to a celebration in Jerusalem and they lose him. This is the story that every parent's like, see, I'm not a bad parent. This happened to Mary and Joseph. I left my kids somewhere too. We are in great company, right? I know there have been weeks where I'm like, wait, did you have Jaren or did I have Jaren? Like who, which one of us is taking who home? Um, So they lose Jesus and they find him hanging out in the temple as a kid, having some pretty serious conversations with some spiritual experts. And in Luke chapter 251, it says, and then he, Jesus, went to Nazareth with them, Mary and Joseph, and was obedient, but his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And so you see Mary, even as Jesus is young, She's seeing and noticing what he's doing and the gifts that he has. She's hearing what people are speaking over him, and she's storing those things away, and she's holding on to them. And then later, when he is actually beginning his ministry in the book of John, chapter 2, we see, on the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee, and Jesus' mother was there. And Jesus and his disciples also had been invited to the wedding. And when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother says to Jesus, hey, they have no more wine. And he says, woman, why are you involving me? And he says, my hour has not yet come. But Mary says to the servants, just do whatever he tells you. I love this because as a mom, we have this power, right? Like where it's like, we're not telling him what to do. We're just planting the seed over here. Like just do whatever he tells you to do. And she walks away and leaves it and lets it be, right? And Jesus turns water into wine, his very first miracle that Mary is so integrally a part of. And so what we see Mary doing is is not just a general encouragement, but she's calling out these gifts that she sees in her son. Yeah, and this isn't, it's just not a mom saying, hey, you're doing a great job. We live in a culture, right, where we tell our kids that, of, hey, you can be whatever you want to be, you can do whatever you want to do. And and we want to be that encouragement in kids' lives, but also there's something different about seeing the unique gifts. And I want to tell you, this takes intentionality. This takes, like, purpose and focus to really study your kids. Like, we know a lot of different things, maybe about um, different things in the world around us. It could be work. It could be shows that we like. We need that same kind of intentionality with our kids. 
where we know what's going on in their life. We know what's taking. We're watching them closely enough where we can see those unique gifts. And it's not just general encouragement like you're doing a great job, but where we can speak out. And I love this, that Mary really set up the first miracle that Jesus ever did. Like she had that opportunity because she knew the gifts in his life and she began to call out that potential. And parents, that's that same thing that we need to do for our kids of calling out their potential of seeing how God has gifted them and what God has done in their life and we're speaking those words over their life so that they can step into those God moments and God opportunities that he has for them yeah this was really timely because I just had a moment like this about a month ago Um, some of you guys know our son Gabriel he's 16 I think he's oh he's in the back there you can give a little wave Gabriel we always tell our kids they're going to be involved on Sunday service, so they have a forewarning. But So Gabriel's a really gifted artist. He's really, really good at art. And a, about a month ago, I was at a conference. I was just having time where I was just praying and just kind of listening to the voice of God. And I just felt like God said, you need to call this out of Gabriel. Um, and I, I came home that day. I said, hey, Gabe, come here. I just want to talk to you about something. And I said, you can take this for what it's worth, but this is what I felt like God was saying is there's a difference between a skill you acquire and a gift you've been given. And we can acquire a lots of skills in our lives, and those are great, but there's also gifts that God places in our life that are honestly supernatural, something that God gives us and he has a purpose and a plan for. And I said, I know you're really, really good at art and I know you're aware of that, but I don't think it's just a skill you're good at. I think God has given you a gift and there's a purpose and a plan there. And I just want to call that out of you. Don't let that go dormant. Don't push that off to the side as something that's just for fun. There's something there that God's doing in your life And the whole time I'm saying this, he and Aaron are kind of like making eyes at each other and like giggling. And I'm like, what's going on? And Aaron says, you had no idea, but I literally just had this conversation with him like two hours ago before you got home. Like, what a cool God thing. And honestly, I thought, Lord, what if I would not have taken that time to just sit and hear God's voice and like be talking to him about my kids And in that prayer moment and to hear what he had to say, what if I wasn't connected enough to Gabriel to have this conversation, to sit down and encourage him and to call that out of him? And that's what God is calling us to. And can I tell you, even as a kid, I remember now as an adult, the adults in my church, the adults in my school who spoke like that to me who said, you guys know I lead worship on Sundays. There were multiple women who would pull me aside on Sunday and say, I hear you singing. There's something there you need to push into. God's called you, and that's a gift in your life. I don't know if I would lead worship today if it wasn't for those women continuing to call that out of me. There is power in what we call out of these kids and out of these students that God has put into our lives. And I love that, and I love that um, about our church because – we are in a community of faith where we can do that for one another. And it's not, once again, just, you know, for moms or for parents. But I want to take a moment and just celebrate Pastor Caleb, our creative pastor, who's there in the back. We love you, man. You know, our family has known Caleb for a number of years now. And there have been so many times where Caleb will come up, just what we talked about. And he'll um, go to Gabe and say, hey, Gabe, I was thinking about you and I bought you this sketchbook. Or, hey, Gabe, I I bought you these drawing pencils or different things. And when we had the talent show just a few weeks ago for our student ministry, Caleb was one of the first ones. He bought some of Gabe's artwork, and it's hanging upstairs in his office. And over and over again, Caleb is that example. It's, you know, Gabe's not his kid, but he says, I see something in you, and I want to call out that potential. I want to call out what God is doing. And that is such a powerful picture, church, of what each and every one of us should be, not only with our own kids, but we're looking in the community of faith around us and people that God has placed in our life, and we're looking for those God moment, those God opportunities to say, I see something in you, and I want to speak that over your life. I want to encourage you in that. I want to challenge you to step up into those God gifts that he has placed inside of you. That's the kind of people that we need to be. And so this is so powerful. Once again, moms, take the pressure off of being perfect or always doing it right. We're, we're going to make mistakes along the way. But these are some beautiful examples of things that we can refocus in on. Of God, I want to be someone that prays for kids. I want to be someone that prays over my children. Lord, I'll, I want to be someone that stands up, even if if maybe my safety or whatever it costs, God, I'm willing to stand in for the next generation. 
And God, I want to see the gift and the potential in people, and I want to call that out. That's the kind of individuals that we want to be. That's the kind of moms that are here in this church, and we want to celebrate you and encourage you in those things that God has placed in your life and what we see from Scripture. And so I want to take a moment and pray for us. And if you would just bow your head and close your eyes, even if you're watching online and maybe you're by yourself, if you would just do that and take a moment and just reflect on what God's encouraged us with. You know, with each of these mothers, what I see in their life is relationship. They have relationship with their kids that opened up the door for this, a desire and a love for their kid. And this is reflected in the heart of God. We have a God that loves us, that believes the best about us, that encourages us, that places gifts and potential in our life, that stands in the gap when we need him to. That's the kind of God we serve. And there may be those of you in this room or those of you watching online that you feel a disconnect from God. Maybe you've been trying to do this on your own and you see the mistakes and the mess ups and God's not in heaven waiting to judge you or or waiting to condemn you. He is there, a loving Father that wants to bring you back into relationship with Him. That's why He gave His Son. And if that's you and you just be honest and say, Aaron, I I do, I feel disconnected from God. I don't feel close to Him, but I, I want that relationship. I want to know a God that loves me and that believes the best about me. I want to get to know Him more. I'm going to lead us in a prayer. And I'm going to ask all of us to say this out loud, even when everyone joining us online, if you would say this out loud, let's pray this together because we don't want anyone praying alone. Lord, we come to you. And we say we need you in our lives. You see our sin. You see our mistakes. And you offer forgiveness. So we invite you in to a relationship with us. Be the Savior of our life. Be the Lord of our life. Give us a brand new start. We pray this in your name. Amen. Now, church, can you just put your hands together and celebrate? If you prayed that prayer, I believe this, that the Bible says that heaven is rejoicing that heaven throws a party and they're celebrating of you coming back into a right relationship with God and knowing his love. And we're celebrating with you. We're so excited. There is something that's happening inside of you. I believe that when you pray that prayer and say, God, I want that connection. I want that relationship with you. And God wants to do something amazing in your life. That's the kind of God he is. And I just want to pray. And if you guys would just make a personal commitment right now to pray with me. Just the challenge, whatever maybe God's speaking to you, something from today that stood out that you just feel challenged with, but will you just um, pray with me? Lord, thank you for your word and thank you, God, for reminding us who you've called us to be. Lord, I always leave your word challenged, God, to continue to pursue the way that you've made me to live my life. And Lord, I know that I'm never going to be perfect, but I know that you've called me to be this life giver. I know that you've called me to pray with persistence and that there's power in prayer, God, and praying over the next generation. I know you've called me, Lord, to stand up and to protect God and to be a guardian. Lord, for the, the people, the children, the students, the young people that you've placed in my life and around my life, God. I know, Lord, that you have called me to continue to call out gifts, to encourage, to speak life, Lord, and encourage the the people that you've placed around me. So God, challenge me, encourage me, open my eyes, keep me connected to you, help my ears to hear your voice, what you have to say every single day to keep my eyes up and my mouth open to be able to speak, Lord, life over other people. God, I pray that you would continue, Lord, to give us the grace that we need from you to live each day walking according to your word. We love you and we thank you and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.